Hello, my name is Van de Keizer. I am a neuroradiologist in Ghent University Hospital in Belgium. And this is a video presentation on imaging abnormalities following seizures. What am I going to talk about today? Well, these are going to be the topics of my presentation. I'm going to start with a short introduction. Then I'm going to talk about the spectrum of seizure-induced imaging abnormalities on perfusion CT. Then about the same spectrum on MRI of the brain and we're going to end with a summary and some key messages. So let's get started. By way of introduction, I'm showing you two cases. These are two patients who presented at the ER and in whom a code stroke was performed. The upper patient is a 67-year-old male patient who presented with acute Broca aphasia and the patient underneath is an 80-year-old female patient who presented with acute Wernicke aphasia. So for a good understanding of this presentation, it's important that you know a little bit about perfusion CT, what these maps mean. I am not going to explain them in detail. If you don't, there's a video presentation on this channel discussing the basics of perfusion CT, check it out. So in the upper patient, the patient with an acute Broca aphasia, what do we see? We see on the CBF and the CBV map that there's a clear uh, decrease in the area of the left frontal operculum, so the area where the anatomical, anatomical Broca area is situated, and there's an increase on the time to drain map. And the patient underneath, we basically see the reverse pattern in another region. We see in the left parietal cortex that there is an increase in cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume. And there is a very slight, very subtle decrease on the time to drain map. So we're dealing with two different kinds of abnormalities here. We're dealing with a clear hypoperfusion in the upper patient, and we are dealing with a hyperperfusion in the patient underneath. The first patient had a classical acute ischemic stroke. If we look back, and it's a bit masked by the text here, but we can see some demarcation of an infarction, it's the vascular territory, and on the CT angiography, which I'm not showing, the patient had an occlusion of the M2 branch supplying the frontal lobe on the left side. So this was a classical acute ischemic stroke, but in the patient underneath, what's going on there? We're dealing with a hyperperfusion. How can this ex explain the acute Wernicke aphasia? This examination was performed in 2013, so over 10 years ago. I saw it as a resident. I had a little experience with perfusion CT. Remember, Mr. Clean still had to be published. So endovascular thrombectomies were, were not as uh, uh, frequently performed as they are now. So this was completely new and everybody, everyone was a bit worried. What are we looking at? What are we dealing with here? And an urgent MRI of the brain was performed. And on the flare images, we, at a first glance, see nothing out of the ordinary. And then we did a diffusion and ADC map because we were still worried that we were dealing with a stroke and what do we see it's very subtle but there's an increased signal and the left parietal lobe on the diffusion map and a decreased signal on the ADC map so this is basically diffusion restriction very subtle uh, without a correlate on the flare map and the area in which these abnormalities are observed correspond to the area with hyperperfusion on the perfusion map so after uh, delving into the medical literature a little bit, we came to the conclusion that these were most likely seizure-related abnormalities. And the uh, neurologist uh, agreed with this, an EEG was performed, EEG findings were also suggestive, and the patient was started on uh, anti-epileptic treatment, and the aphasia clearly improved the following couple of days. So this was, for me, my first confrontation with seizure-related abnormalities, both on perfusion CT and on MRI. And this was also one of the first case reports I ever published in the medical literature. Here am I, the neuroradiologist, as a first author, published in the world-renowned Journal of the Belgian Society of Radiology, and I'm still very, very proud of this publication, I have to say. So, let's start first with what is a seizure exactly, because we interpreted the previous findings as seizure-related. When we say seizure, we often think uh, tonic-clonic convulsions, but a seizure is more than that. It's more than the 
typical clinical presentation of a patient having uh, generalized tonic-clonic convulsions. There's a wide spectrum of clinical presentations. I'm not going to go into detail, but what is a seizure? It's basically the transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to the abnormal, excessive or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. And the term seizure and the term epilepsy are often uh, used interchangeably, but they are two different things. So a lot of people will have a seizure in their lifetime. So about 10% of the general population, if I'm not mistaken, will suffer from a seizure in their lifetime. But those patients or those people don't necessarily have epilepsy. If, uh, for uh, epilepsy, there are um, several criteria. And this is just one of them. It's a bit more detailed than this, but this is basically uh, the most important one to talk about epilepsy. You have to have at least two unprovoked seizures at least 24 hours apart. And in patients with epilepsy, it is assumed that these patients have a brain that has a pathological and an enduring tendency to have recurrent seizures. So a seizure is something that can occur just once in a lifetime, but as soon as you have multiple seizures over um, uh, not within 24 hours, but over, you know, um, a certain amount of time. If you have multiple seizures, you have epilepsy. Simple as that. And what's also important to know for this presentation, I'm not going to go into detail, but animal studies have shown that seizures can actually cause brain damage. So despite the fact that these are generally uh, transient occurrences, they can cause brain damage. And you can have chronic uh, brain damage as a, uh, a result of having suffered from seizures, especially if you have repetitive seizures or prolonged seizures. So it also makes sense that if animal studies have shown that you can have chronic brain damage as a result of seizures, that you should be able to see some kind of acute brain damage following or during a seizure, kind of makes sense. And a second thing that is important to know is that seizures can also cause vascular changes in the brain, because when you're having a seizure, your neurons are firing widely and excessively, and they need a lot of energy. Energy, a supply for uh, energy, you need oxygen and glucose, which is supplied by blood. So, in regions of the brain that are extremely hyperactive due to seizures or epileptic activity, more blood is required and vascular changes will take place. So, this is just basics, but it's important to know because that's the base of why we actually can see abnormalities in seizure patients on MRI and perfusion CT. So brain injury or brain damage is basically something that is uh, structurally wrong. And we would expect we should be able to see it on CT and or MRI. And in practice, we mainly see it on MRI. Sometimes you can see subtle abnormalities on CT, but the sensitivity to detect these abnormalities is not that high. So it's mainly an MRI finding. And the vascular changes we should be able to detect on perfusion studies like CT perfusion or MRI perfusion and in radiological practice, we mainly pick them up on CT perfusion. And why that is, I'm going to tell you right away in this part on seizure-induced abnormalities on perfusion CT. So why do we often detect seizures on perfusion CT or seizure-induced abnormalities? Well, that's because seizures are a well-known stroke mimic and perfusion CT as an imaging study, we typically perform in patients suspected of suffering from an acute ischemic stroke. Now, about 20% of patients presenting at the ER suspected of suffering from an acute ischemic stroke actually don't have a stroke. They have something else. They have a stroke mimic. And you can have a lot of stroke mimics. You can have medical stroke mimics or functional stroke mimics. Functional stroke mimics meaning well, it's more psychologically conversion disorder. Uh, and when it comes to the medical stroke mimics, seizures or are actually a very large part of stroke mimics. Seizures are responsible for about 20 to 30% of stroke mimics, followed by migraine with aura, which is responsible for about 10%. So it makes sense that if seizures can present with stroke-like symptoms or induce stroke-like symptoms, that these patients will receive a perfusion CT of the brain, and then we can uh, detect the seizure-induced perfusion abnormalities, of which I'm going to talk about right away. Now, it's important to be able to pick up perfusion abnormalities induced by a seizure because, well, it 
can have implications for the therapy. If we see something in perfusion CT that looks like a seizure rather than a stroke, your, your neurologist might think twice before administering intravenous thrombolysis, for instance. Um, well, there have been some studies on thrombolysis risk and stroke mimics. So patients uh, who are actually not suffering from an acute ischemic stroke, uh, but received intravenous thrombolysis nevertheless, and the hemorrhage risk is quite low. So there's one study, uh, I forgot to include the reference, but it really exists, believe me, and about 100 patients presenting with stroke mimics who received thrombolysis, and only one patient developed a hemorrhage. But of course, that's maybe one too many. So if you can refrain from administering it if you're certain that the patient is not suffering from a stroke, which is sometimes not very easy, but perfusion CT can help. Well, it's an important thing to pick up. Uh, and how can seizures present as strokes exactly? Why is that possible? Well, once again, that's because we assume that seizures are always these generalized tonic-clonic convulsions, but that's not the case. You have a lot of ways uh, in which uh, seizures can manifest clinically. You can have non-convulsive seizures. You can have complex partial seizures in which patients will have an impaired consciousness and uh, which can also cause language dysfunction, so resembling an aphasia. Then you have the so-called TOTS phenomenon, which are focal neurological deficits uh, following a seizures, and that can be uh, hemiparesis, that can be aphasia, can be something else. So you can have focal neurological deficits in the post-ictal phase, so the phase following a seizure. And lastly, we also have so-called post-stroke epilepsy. So uh, epilepsy occurring in the region, in the region um, around an old brain infarction. And that can cause, for instance, a worsening of pre-existing clinical deficits. Uh, a classical example is a patient with uh, well-known uh, unilateral hemiparesis following an old stroke who presents at the ER because of worsening of the paresis or worsening of his symptoms. And that's often induced by epilepsy and uh, brain parenchyma surrounding the old stroke. Uh, but then again, to make things more complicated, you also can have it the other way around. And epileptic seizures are known to occur in about 1% to 6% of acute ischemic strokes. So um, it goes both ways. Uh, sometimes seizure can be the main symptom of an acute ischemic stroke or the presenting symptom. So it's not always easy, but perfusion CT can be helpful. And there are two important patterns that can be detected on patients during or following a, seizures, uh, a seizure. And here they are. These are two patients who received a perfusion CT and in whom the final diagnosis was not acute ischemic stroke, but seizure related. And in patient number one, uh, and the abnormalities are seen in the same region, so the right parietal lobe. In patient number one, we see that there's an increase in the cerebral blood flow and the cerebral blood volume. And well, Sometimes you can see a subtle decrease, but in this case, it's uh, very subtle, but there's a subtle decrease in the mean transit time and the time to drain uh, in this area. And in patient number two, we have the reverse, the reverse pattern. So in this patient, we see a decrease in cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume and an increase in mean transit time and time to drain, which is basically a hypoperfusion pattern and a bit similar to what you can see in an acute ischemic stroke. So it can be difficult sometimes, but not in this case. In the hyperperfusion pattern, this is basically the reverse pattern. So we have two main patterns, a hyperperfusion pattern and a hypoperfusion pattern. How it is possible that seizures can cause both these patterns, I'll explain later. So let's now just, uh, now just believe Believe me, we have these two main patterns that can be observed. So this is the seizure-related hyperperfusion pattern. And we will always see that the cortex is involved, but never the white matter. The underlying white matter is not involved. It's always cortical. And it's typically in a non-vascular distribution because it's a non-vascular uh, entity or a non-vascular pathology. And on the perfusion maps, uh, we will see an increase in cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood flow. Volume. So the total amount of blood and the local blood supply is increased. So we have a hyperemia or a hyperperfusion. And abnormalities on mean transit time and time to drain can be 
quite subtle or non-existent. Uh, and if they are present, you will see a decrease, but it's often a slight decrease. And then the reverse pattern, seizure-related hypoperfusion. What do we see? Well, the cortex is always involved, but also the white matter. Uh, classically, it's a non-vascular distribution, but it can mimic a vascular distribution. But if you see it's non-vascular, you can be more certain that it's not going to be an acute ischemic stroke. And we have the reverse here, cerebral blood flow and volume are diminished and mean transit time and time to drain have increased. So we have a hypoperfusion pattern. And this is a nice example of a patient with a hyperperfusion. At a first glance, we'd say it's normal, but look closely, look for asymmetries, look closely to the temporal and occipital lobe over here and the perisylvian area over here, compare it with the other side, and you see that it is clearly, we clearly have an increase in both blood flow and blood volume, and there's maybe a subtle, subtle decrease in mean transit time compared to the other side, and in time to drain, uh, but that's even more subtle, so it's a bit wishful thinking maybe, but it's very clear on cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume. And on CT angiography, well, this is uh, not a vascular, so we don't expect to see an occlusion. The patient did not have an occlusion. Uh, but what did we see in this patient? Well, we saw uh, an increased number of vessels uh, in the area of the right temporal lobe. And let's compare it with the other side here. This is basically a normal uh, distribution of vessels over here, but there's a clear increase. So that's basically visualizing the hyperemia on CT angiography. So the correlate or the analog of the finding on the perfusion CT. And well, hyperperfusion, I could show you a million examples. I have a lot of them, but it's always a bit the same. The, the area can be different, but it's always the same pattern. And it doesn't pose a lot of difficulties. It doesn't really pose a lot of uh, differential diagnostic difficulties. Pure theoretically, it is sometimes said that if you have an acute ischemic infarction and you have a reperfusion of the occluded vessel, you could get some kind of a luxury perfusion and a luxury hyperperfusion. I've only seen this described in the medical literature. I must say I've never seen it in practice. Not with such a strongly increased cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume as I typically see in patients who have seizure-related hyperperfusion. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but to me it seems an entity that is not that frequently encountered in uh, daily radiological practice and more encountered in uh, articles and textbooks books. But this is just my personal experience. If you've seen it, want to share a case, please do. Now, let's move on to hypoperfusion because hypoperfusion can be a bit more difficult. Uh, why is that? Well, a classical acute ischemic stroke will also present as an area of hypoperfusion on perfusion maps. And this is a patient with a hypoperfusion pattern. And what do we see? We see a clear increase in mean transit time and T max. Uh, so basically, uh, perfusion parameters uh, that have increased. So, um, uh, well, it's clear, I believe, and it involves the entire hemisphere and all vascular territories. Look for the occipital area or the occipital lobe is just as involved as the middle cerebral artery uh, territory. And we also see a clear decrease in the cerebral blood flow map, but not so much on the cerebral blood volume map. Maybe a little bit posteriorly over here. Uh, but it's not that extreme. And this is just one example of the different patterns you can see in seizure-related hypoperfusion. But it's one, personally, I've seen the most. The hollow hemispheric pattern, so these are the three different patterns you can see. The hollow hemispheric pattern, in my experience, is the most frequent one, and it's basically a hypoperfusion involving an entire hemisphere. And because multiple vascular territories are involved, so like in this case, both the area of the posterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and anterior cerebral artery, you can already assume
assume that this is not going to have uh, a classical vascular cause, this pattern. Uh, it can be a bit more difficult in the watershed pattern. It's not that frequent. It's basically a bit similar to the hollow hemispheric pattern, but just less pronounced and you only see perfusion abnormalities in the watershed territories. When you see this pattern, you could also suspect a patient of having a carotid artery stenosis, but that is something you can easily rule out with a CT angiography. And lastly, can also a bit confusing, the focal pattern or lober pattern. Let's talk a bit about differential diagnosis and let's start with the lober pattern. Uh, we see in this patient a clear decrease on cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood uh, volume map and uh, uh, left parietal lobe. So let's remove the areas once again. I must say cerebral blood volume is not that pronounced, but it's clearly seen on cerebral blood flow. And we see an increase in time to drain and Tmax. Now the question is, well, I'm telling you this is a post-ictal focal or, or lobar hyperperfusion, but you can ask me now, Sven, why is this not a stroke? Uh, well, just looking at it quickly, you could say, well, it's an area of hyperperfusion, it could be a stroke, right? Let's see, let's find some arguments. So first of all, well, it's not vascular. Uh, it goes way too much to the midline for me. So basically saying that part of the posterior cerebral artery territory is involved as well. So the pattern is not really a vascular to begin with. I'm not showing you the CT angiography images, but no occlusion could be found. And okay, with this pattern, you can expect the occlusion to be a bit more uh, peripherally. So maybe we are missing it, but uh, I looked really, really carefully and could really find a vascular explanation. And this is based on my experience. So uh, I haven't really found it well uh, described in medical literature, but uh, the hyperperfusion you see in postictal patients is often very mild. So you often have uh, a more pronounced Tmax more than four seconds increase and a Tmax more than six seconds increase. And as you know from the pre previous presentation on perfusion CT and stroke, the definition of hyperperfusion and acute ischemic stroke, well, it's defined as a Tmax more than six seconds. If you look at this patient, the Tmax more than six seconds region is pretty small and it's mainly a very mild hyperperfusion. But this is subjective and this is based on my personal experience, which is a very low grade of evidence. So take that with a grain of salt, maybe, and you should always question everything, even things that are published. So, uh, and then especially if people say it's based on my experience as an expert, I'm not even an expert, um, but I didn't say that. Uh, okay, let's now go into another differential diagnostic consideration in patients with hypoperfusion. I'm showing you now the images of two patients with a clear hollow hemispheric hypoperfusion. We see in both patients that there's an increase in mean transit time and time to drain involving the right hemisphere. In this patient, it looks a bit more pronounced. And in this patient, the territory of the posterior and anterior cerebral artery seem not to be involved. Okay, we can already assume that this will probably be post-ictal or seizure related because it's not really vascular. And this could be an internal carotid artery stenosis. On the CBF map, we see some decrease in both patients. Once again, more pronounced than patient number two. Let's now verify our hypothesis. Okay, so there's an increase in cerebral blood flow. And patient number one, let's look at the CT angiography. And what do we see? We already suspected it a bit based on the pattern, but we really need this verification. We see that there's a high grade stenosis of the internal carotid artery on the involved side. And this explains the pattern of hypoperfusion we see here. And the second patient, however, when we look at the internal carotid artery, we see no stenosis whatsoever. So we have a non, we have a pattern that's basically non-vascular and we don't have a vascular explanation for the pattern. Well, we didn't expect one, but we, we can't find abnormalities either in the internal carotid artery. So what are our final conclusions? Patient number one has a hemodynamic, hemodynamic hyperperfusion caused by a high-grade internal carotid artery stenosis. And in patient number two, 
the uh, hyperperfusion is attributed to having suffered from a seizure and this is uh, the hollow hemispheric hyperperfusion pattern. So what we'll return in this presentation is that before, when you call something seizure related, you have to be sure you've, you've excluded all possible alternatives. So that's what you're basically doing here when interpreting these perfusion studies before calling them seizure related or seizure induced, we have to rule out all possible alternatives. Um, and the main ones are when you're dealing with hypoperfusion, acute ischemic stroke, and a high grade internal carotid artery stenosis. This is an example of a 72 year old male patient who had an old left MCA infarction and who presented at the ER with confusioning and worsening of his pre existing right hemiparesis. I already told you about that post stroke epilepsy uh, is not that infrequent in my experience. And these are the perfusion studies in this patient. And what draws our attention immediately is the presence of the old stroke, which is clearly visible as a perfusion deficit on the CBF and CBV maps and black holes on the MTT map and the Tmax. But what's also very conspicuous and best seen on the MTT and Tmax map is that this old infarction is surrounded by an area of severe hypoperfusion involving also the territories of the left anterior and posterior cerebral artery, so a non-vascular pattern. And this was, um, once again, a hollow, a hollow hemispheric hypoperfusion, and in this case, probably triggered by the gliotic uh, tissue of the old MCA infarction on the ipsilateral side. What is an explanation for the perfusion patterns I have just shown you? Well, the explanation is a thing called neurovascular coupling. And neurovascular coupling is basically very, very simple. Changes in neuronal activity will lead to changes in cerebral blood flow. If your neurons become more active, they need more oxygen, they need more energy. And the brain immediately responds to that by locally increasing the cerebral blood flow. Um, this is based on a very complex interplay between your neurons, glial and vascular cells. And these are called together the neurovascular units. So it's not similar to what happens uh, vascularly when you suffer a stroke. In that case, it's the change and pressure that induces your vascular changes. In this case, pressure doesn't change. The increase locally in cerebral blood flow as a response to the locally increased neuronal activity. And this is basically the basis of this principle as the basis of fMRI and also of nuclear imaging studies like SPECT and PET-CT, uh, or PET studies rather. Um, so let's now translate neurovascular coupling to what happens on perfusion studies and patients having suffered a seizure. When you suffer a seizure, you have the ictal phase. That's the phase in which your neurons are firing widely and synchronously, and in which you have the typical uh, epileptic symptoms. Uh, don't necessarily, uh, those don't necessarily have to be convulsions, can also be complex seizures, but that's basically the symptomatic phase. So your neurons are firing widely and they are very active and need a lot of energy and your brain responds by locally increasing your cerebral blood flow and that will lead to a hyperperfusion and that is what we detect on our perfusion CT studies the this hyperperfusion and the area that is firing wildly and in the post ictal phase well then your neurons are completely exhausted they need some time to recover patients often have post ictal symptoms in this phase and these can be uh, very variable, can be some confusion, can be fatigue, can be headache, but can also be focal neurological deficits and uh, those things we call uh, a TOTS phenomenon. And while your neurons are exhausted, they're basically asleep, uh, they're trying to regain their energy and they need less uh, blood at the moment. We have a decreased cerebral blood flow and an area of a hypoperfusion. So that's pretty easy to understand, except that in practice, it's not 100% correct. This is also a study. Uh, I was a uh, co-author here. 
uh, and we published this. This was something I made with my old colleagues from the University Hospital in Aachen in Germany. And it's a very nice study. It's titled Can Perfusion CT Unmask Post Ictostroke Dynamics? And what we did is we retrospectively re-examined the perfusion CT studies in patients in whom the final neurologic and patients who presented at ER with a code stroke, suspected of having a stroke, but in whom the final neurological diagnosis was, well, it wasn't a stroke, this patient had a seizure. So the diagnosis was, wasn't actually based on perfusion CT, it was the final clinical diagnosis, and we then retrospectively analyzed CT to look uh, the perfusion CT studies, which all these patients got, uh, to see what kind of patterns we could detect. And our expectation was, well, the neurologist also tried, based on EEG and the clinical findings, to determine if the patient was in the ictal phase or post-ictal phase when the patient received his perfusion CT studies. And our expectation is, well, if you're in the ictal phase, we expect to see a hyperperfusion. And if you're in the post-ictal phase, we expect to see a hypoperfusion because this makes sense. But making sense in medicine, well, pretty useless uh, common sense because it rarely works out. And it didn't work out in this study either. What did we observe? Well, first of all, in the majority of patients, the perfusion CT studies were normal. Irregardless of whether the patient was in the ictal or the post-ictal phase, normal studies were, well, basically the norm, uh, about 60%, 62. And we saw hyperperfusion and hypoperfusion in about 20% of patients, respectively. If we then look, uh, we have subdivided them in ictal patients and then post-ictal patients without neurological deficits, so just confusion, fatigue, headache, and so on, and post-ictal uh, patients with neurological deficits, like a hemiparesis or nephasia, uh, phenomenon, in other words. And what did, we, what did we see there? Well, even in patients that phase, like a half of them have no perfusion abnormalities, and about 60 to 70 percent of post ictal patients have no perfusion abnormalities on perfusion CT. So you can't use perfusion CT as a mere diagnostic tool. You can't use it as a tool to say, well, the patient with 100 percent certainty or seizure is ruled out with 100 percent certainty. It's something you cannot do, unfortunately. Um, now, if, you did see, if we did see abnormalities, what did we see? In the ictal patients, about 40%, a bit less, had a hyperperfusion. But then, this is very strange, about 10% had a hyperperfusion. So here our theory didn't really work out. And the same is true for the post-ictal patients. About 20%, whether they had neurological deficits or not, uh, didn't really matter. About 20% had a hypoperfusion pattern, but then about 10% to 16% had a hyperperfusion pattern. And you know, this is strange. So in the end, we couldn't really use, perf we can't use perfusion CT to rule out seizure. You can't do it. And you can't use the observed pattern to say with 100% certainty what the phase of the patient is. If it's an ictal patient or post-ictal, can't be done either. So what are main, the main conclusions we can draw from this study? Well, you see normal perfusion in more than 50% of all patients. You see hyperperfusion in about 40% of ictal patients and hyperperfusion in about 20% of post-ictal patients. Now, that's not in line with our expectations. And what are possible explanations for this? Well, one was the resolution of perfusion CT. Uh, we assumed that maybe in a, a lot of cases, the involved area is either too small to be detected on perfusion CT or the perfusion abnormalities or basically too subtle to be detectable. Uh, probably neurovascular dynamics play a role because that has also been shown in nuclear imaging studies uh, and patients at the post-ictal phase. In a lot of cases, also a hyperperfusion pattern was observed. And a possible theory is that, well, okay, you have neurovascular coupling, so it's normal to assume cerebral blood flow will decrease if your neurons are completely exhausted and they don't need that much blood. But another theory is, well, you can see hyperperfusion because these neurons that are exhausted will need more energy to recover and will need more blood. So it's a possible explanation. So the neurovascular dynamics are probably a bit more complicated than this simple paradigm. In the ictal phase, you will have hyperperfusion. And in the post-ictal phase, you will have hypoperfusion. That's too 
easy. And then a uh, limitation of our study was, well, the assumption that patients were ictal or post-ictal at the moment they received a perfusion CT was based on clinical findings, a clinical diagnosis, but a distinction is not always easy to make clinically. And our neurologists also admitted that. They tried everything they do to get an, uh, uh, an as good as possible explanation. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can't be 100% sure because no EEG was performed. Well, we never do that during the perfusion CT. And that would have been the only way to be 100% sure did the patient still have an area of the brain that was epileptically active or not during the perfusion CT? And uh, the main differential diagnosis of post-ictal hypoperfusion would be an acute ischemic stroke or a high-grade internal carotid artery stenosis. So it's very important to examine the pattern. Is it a vascular pattern or not? Correlated with CT angiography, rule out uh, large or medium-sized vessel occlusions or a high-grade carotid stenosis, and in some cases also clinical correlation. This brings us to the third part. So perfusion CT is something that is generally done in the acute phase, patients presenting with stroke-like symptoms, and often in the second phase, these patients uh, who have suffered a seizure or suspected of having suffered a stroke receive an MRI. And I'm now I am now going to talk about seizure-induced abnormalities on MRI, and I'm going to start with discussion on the typical location and the typical appearance of seizure-induced, often reversible, MRI abnormalities. So SRMA for short, because that's a handful to write down each and every time. So um, what can I tell you about seizure-induced abnormalities on MRI? They have been described in the medical literature since the early 90s, uh, and on CT even somewhat earlier, but they're not often detected on CT, I have to say. And it basically comes down to, well, they are basically a diagnosis of exclusion, because when talking about seizure-induced abnormalities on MRI, we're talking about reversible MRI abnormalities in patients who have suffered a seizure shortly before the MRI, or who uh, suffer from status epilepticus and whom, no, and whom no other explanation can be found uh, clinically or radiologically for the observed abnormalities. And keep that in mind. I will go into more detail on the most important differential diagnostic considerations, but now keep in mind that we're basically dealing with a diagnosis of exclusion. Before calling something a seizure-induced abnormality, be sure it can't be anything else radiologically and or clinically. Um, this is from a very nice study published in Epilepsy and Behavior in 2023. Seizure-induced abnormalities, are they frequent? Well, not that frequent. They are observed in only about 7% of patients who receive an MRI shortly following a seizure. And they are mostly seen in older patients and in patients who have suffered from a prolonged seizure, including status epilepticus. And the observation of abnormalities on MRI is not associated with a worse prognosis or with worse subsequent seizure control. Uh, so conclusion here is, well, they're basically not that frequent and mainly seen after longer seizures. And what are the typical locations for these seizures? Oh, seiz I'm having some difficulties <laughs> with the word seizure. Um, what are the typical locations for these abnormalities? Well, the cerebral cortex, then we have the hippocampus, and lastly, also a typical location, especially in patients and status epilepticus, the thalamus. And in the thalamus, the abnormalities are mainly seen dorsally or dorsomedially in the area of the pulvinar. And you have also seen these were flare images. These abnormalities are hyper intense on flare, so basically they reflect edema. So typical seizure induced. Uh, MRI abnormalities are areas of edema associated with an increased signal on T2 and flare, often with some swelling, especially when it's located in the cortex. Uh, and where do we find them? Well, I already told you, in the cerebral cortex and or the hippocampus and or the thalamus. And you can see them in multiple locations at the same time, like in this patient who had cortical edema and the right insula, but also here and the pulvinar 
of the right thalamus. This was a 39-year-old female patient in status epilepticus. And this is also a patient with multifocal cortical abnormalities involving the right frontal lobe. This is the right cingulate gyrus. This is the right parietotemporal association cortex. And what is also um, something that can be seen and can also be observed on perfusion CT studies, mind you, is the presence of contralateral edema in the left cerebellar hemisphere. And why is that? Well, it's because there are connections from the cerebral cortex to the contralateral uh, cerebellar cortex. And if you see abnormalities in a cerebral hemisphere, and similar abnormalities in the contralateral cerebellar hemisphere that is called crossed cerebellar dyschiasis. Um, the abnormalities on flare, well, edema, can also be detected on diffusion-weighted imaging. And on diffusion-weighted imaging, these can be diffusion-restrictive or not diffusion-restrictive. In this patient, so it can be shine true or true diffusion restriction. In this patient, we see clear cortical edema involving uh, the left parieto occipital region with an associated increased signal on diffusion weighted images and this was black on the ADC map so this was true diffusion restriction so I should have shown you the ADC map of course to prove it but just believe me this is another example of a patient uh, this is a 10 year old female patient with a nephrotic syndrome was started on cyclosporin and developed hypertension headache and went into status epilepticus and the patient received an emergency MRI and what do we see on the flare images? Well, on these images, nothing, I'd say. Well, really nothing at all. But then we look at the diffusion weighted images and all of a sudden we see an increased signal in the cortex of the left temporal lobe. And mind you, this is not a vascular territory because when we see diffusion restriction in the brain, we immediately think, whoa, it's chemistry stroke. But no, uh, this is not a vascular territory. This here, the medial temporal region is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery and the temporal convexity by the middle cerebral artery, and it's black on the ADC map. So this is not shine true, this is true diffusion restriction. And mind you that no abnormalities, even now, when we now look back on the flare images, we see no abnormalities there. So diffusion weighted sequences can be very sensitive for the detection of seizure induced uh, abnormalities. Uh, they can be more sensitive than your flare sequence. I, love diffusion weighted images and they are generally one of the first things I look at when I know that a patient has suffered a seizure or is in status epilepticus. This is the same girl. These are uh, these are also flare images and now we see abnormalities but we see not cortical but subcortical abnormalities involving the parieto occipital area. Once again this patient was treated with cyclosporin developed hypertension, a headache, and then went into status epilepticus, and now has subcortical abnormalities in the parieto-occipital region. This is the classical finding of a PRESS syndrome, a posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Um, and these abnormalities are different from what we see on the diffusion weighted images, because here too we see an increased signal in the cortex of the left temporal lobe, also involving the insula, and it is black on the ADC map, so through diffusion restriction. Look carefully, these abnormalities are located subcortically, maybe a little bit cortically, but most of the cortex looks normal. So these abnormalities to me are due to press, and this is something different. This is probably seizure related. And also look at the pulvinar. The pulvinar also has an increased signal on diffusion and a low signal on the ADC map. So in conclusion, we have non-vascular cortical diffusion restriction without flare abnormalities. So diffusion here is the most sensitive sequence for the detection of these abnormalities. Here's another example. These are the flare images. We see focal cortical edema involving the uh, left occipital parietal region. Uh, there is some subtle increased signal on diffusion weighted images, but in this case, it isn't black on the ADC map, so this is no true diffusion restriction. So the two are possible. You can have real diffusion restriction, and in some cases, it's more shine true or not real diffusion restriction. And this is another example. We've already seen this case. These are very uh, subtle diffusion abnormalities, but it's true diffusion restriction. Uh, 
And well, if you look back, you can say that maybe the cortical signal is slightly increased, but you would never call it or pick it up if you wouldn't have these diffusion abnormalities. So they can be subtle even on diffusion weighted images, because look carefully, these are uh, images I windowed strongly to see the abnormality more clearly in this patient. And a final case, um, if you look quickly, maybe you wouldn't have picked it up, but this patient received a perfusion CT a couple of hours earlier, and we saw a clear hyperperfusion involving the posterior parieto-occipital region, and we now on the flare images see a clear asymmetrical flare hyperentem swelling of the cerebral cortex over here, and it's also seen on the diffusion weighted images, probably not real diffusion restriction, more shine through, and we also see it, but more subtly, on the T2 weighted images. So the findings can be subtle and you really have to look for them, sometimes window your images and if you have a perfusion CT performed a couple of hours earlier, uh, correlate because the abnormalities will often be found in the same region. Now that's for the cerebral cortex. In the hippocampus, this is an 87-year-old female patient with acute sensory aphasia, and it was asked to rule out an acute ischemic stroke. And what do we see in the flare images? We see some old gliotic changes, and we can't see it, but the patient had suffered a hemorrhagic stroke a couple of years earlier, and there was a lot of uh, gliosis in the area uh, of the left temporal lobe, and we only see a bit of it. And what do we see here? There's some asymmetrical increase and in the flare signal involving the uncus and the amygdala and the hippocampus on the left side. And on the diffusion weighted images, and this is an old examination, image quality is a bit low, we see that there is diffusion restriction, but the diffusion restriction in the hippocampus is more is uh, located laterally in the hippocampus in the so-called CA1 sector. And that is very typical for um, diffusion restriction and seizure-related hippocampal edema. The CA1 sector, which is located laterally in the hippocampus, is the most vulnerable sector of the hippocampus and will often be the one associated with diffusion restriction. Do not believe me, well, it's really a recurring finding in a post-ictal hippocampal edema. So this is another patient with post-ictal hippocampal edema or well, post-ictal seizure-related hippocampal edema. And we see edema and the uncus and the left hippocampus. And on diffusion-weighted images, we see that there is diffusion restriction but only laterally in the hippocampus. And this is actually very nice if you look at it. And uh, located here in between is the dentate gyrus, uh, which is not diffusion restrictive at all. And these are the ADC maps, so this was true diffusion restriction. And finally, the same patient, one last time, diffusion restriction laterally at the left hippocampus with a low signal on the ADC map. Now, how do we explain this combination of findings on MRI? When it comes to the cortical findings, these probably uh, reflect the presence of focal cortical epileptic activity. We assume that when the cortex uh, has uh, edema, um, this is probably the region that is epilep uh, epileptically active. But keep in mind that does not mean that this is the location of the epileptic focus. The epileptogenic focus can be located somewhere else in the brain, but this is where the epileptic activity has spread to. Uh, when it comes to the hippocampus, the hippocampus is very often involved and it's probably very vulnerable because it has a lot of glutamate receptors. So one of the mechanisms for seizure-induced uh, abnormalities is glutaminergic uh, excitotoxicity. So if a structure has a lot of glutamate receptors, it will be more vulnerable, which is the case uh, in the case of the hippocampus. And lastly, when it comes to thalamic abnormalities, which are mostly seen in patients in status epilepticus, that's probably due to the presence of a lot of uh, reciprocal connections between the thalamus and the cortex, especially to the pulvinar of the thalamus. Now, a recurring finding is the presence of cortical edema, and that can be main, in some cases, it will mainly be seen on flare images, uh, then can have diffusion restriction, and other cases won't. In some cases, it will be mainly seen on diffusion weighted images, but whatever. So we see 
cortical edema with or without diffusion restriction. How so? Well, the exact mechanism is a bit unclear. There are several theories. What we do though is if you have a seizure, well, your neuronal activity increases. Uh, your glutamate release increases and these neurons are very active. They will need more blood. So there are two possible mechanisms. It can be that it is the result of glutaminergic excitotoxicity due to the increased release of glutamate, or it can be that we get some kind of relative hypoxia because despite the fact that your cerebral blood flow will increase, maybe that won't be enough to meet the increased energy demands of the epileptically active neurons. So uh, remains to be proven, but two possible theories and diffusion restriction can be seen as often called cytotoxic, but in patients in whom it is seizure related, this edema is often reversible. So it's in most cases no true cytotoxic edema, meaning the cells are not about to die. When the seizure stops or is arrested, in a lot of cases, these abnormalities will disappear completely without um, residual uh, damage or leaving behind residual damage, at least not on a microscope topic level. Now let's talk about some of the other imaging abnormalities we can see in seizure related abnormalities uh, or seizure related changes. This is a 25 year old male patient who suffered a first time generalized tonic clonic seizure and was brought to the emergency room and in the emergency room he had an aphasia and a paresis of the right arm so that sounds like a tots paresis uh, non-enhanced of the brain was performed and we see some cortical swelling in this case so in some cases you can detect abnormalities on ct and on the ct angiography we see some focal hyperemia we see a lot of vascular markings in this area compared to the other side and a perfusion ct was performed as well but those uh, this is an examination from the early days of perfusion CT and the quality was so low you couldn't really interpret the study and I'm pretty sure that if it would have been a high quality study we would have seen a hyperperfusion in this area. Uh, the patient also received an MRI of the brain and now we see something special if we magnify the involved area and this is also the area where we saw hyperemia on the CT angiography, we see that maybe there's some subtle increase in the signal of the cortex, but the cortex doesn't really look swollen. But what do we see is an increase in signal of the subcortical white matter. And this subcortical flare signal decrease is often described uh, in patients who have suffered a seizure. And it's a bit of a bizarre finding and a clear explanation is lacking. When I say frequent, it is definitely not as frequent as the presence of clear cortical edema with or without diffusion restriction. But nevertheless, it's something I've observed multiple times yet. And it has always fascinated me a bit what could be the exact explanation for this finding. There are several theories in the medical literature, but well, these, patient never, these patients never receive biopsies, will probably never uh, find out what exactly goes wrong here, and we can only speculate. So that's an additional finding you can see following seizure, a um, uh, decrease in the flare signal and the subcortical white matter uh, in the involved area. This is a patient who has some cortical edema. It's also a bit subtle, but we see some signal increase over here, some swelling, and it's more conspicuous I believe on the diffusion weighted images there's a clear asymmetry the signal is clearly too high compared to the other side uh, and this is in the right parietal lobe and, <clears throat> and now if we look at the susceptib susceptibility weighted images well this is a uh, very nice we see that there are a lot less vessels to be seen in the right hemisphere compared to the other side. Um, and why is that? I'm going to explain you in a minute, even though you can read it there. Let's magnify some of these images to make it more clear for you in case you wouldn't have seen it. So this is the region of the uh, right temporal lobe compared with the left temporal lobe and the parietal occipital transition area. And we see basically no vessels over here and a lot of vessels over here. So what is a possible explanation? Well, we've 
also seen flare and diffusion abnormalities on the right side. So we assume that the right side is abnormal. Why are there less cortical and subparachnoid vessels to be seen on the susceptibility weighted images? Well, this is probably the result of a hyperemia. The uh, oxygenated blood, so the blood present mainly in veins, is paramagnetic. And this causes the signal decrease, uh, a signal decrease on susceptibility weighted images, making the vessels appear black on susceptibility weighted images. In hyperemia, however, there is more oxygenated blood present in the blood vessels relative to deoxygenated blood. So there is less paramagnetic effect, less susceptibility artifact, and the vessels disappear. So we have less vessels because there's actually a relatively hyperemic uh, status going on on the right side. And I window these images a bit and it's even more clearly visible. Now we see a clear, clear asymmetry. We see a lot of cortical and subarachnoid vessels on the left side and we barely see any. Well, we see some of them, but they look thin. They look less compared to the left hemisphere. And if we then look on these MPRH images following gadolinium administration, we can also observe an increased number of subarachnoid and superficial cortical vessels compared to the other side. So this is basically the correlate or the analog of the findings on the susceptibility weighted images reflecting local regional hyperemia or an increased local blood supply or blood flow. Now let's talk about the temporal evolution of these seizure-induced MRI abnormalities. Uh, the R here stands for reversible, and well, they are reversible in the majority of cases. This is a 10-year-old female patient. We've already seen this patient, a nephrotic syndrome, status epilepticus, and we clearly see abnormalities that correspond to PRESS. And the patient received an MRI follow-up study one day later, and we see that these PRESS-associated abnormalities are well, maybe a bit diminished, but not that much. It's pretty much unchanged, uh, maybe a little bit less, but not dramatically. And these are the diffusion weighted abnormalities. And these we attributed to the fact that the patient was in status epilepticus and these are seizure induced, also involving the pulvinar. The patient was immediately started on anti-epileptic treatment and they were able to basically stop the status epilepticus thanks to anti-epileptic treatment. And on the follow-up MRI performed one day later, we see an almost complete regression of these seizure-related cortical abnormalities. There's still something uh, present and the pulvinar here and the thalamus also a bit. This is because of the press. Uh, press can also sometimes be associated with some diffusion restriction uh, this is not really, uh, due to the status. And that is what is seen in the majority of cases. It also depends on, it's hard to say how long it takes for these imaging abnormalities to disappear because in the medical literature, well, there's a wide variability on the timing of follow-up studies. Uh, in the previous patient, we did the follow-up study the next day and they had already completely disappeared. This is a patient who suffered uh, a cardiac arrest following a first time generalized tonic clonic seizure who had a cortical edema and the left parietal lobe, which was uh, somewhat diffusion restrictive or uh, had an increased signal on diffusion weighted images without an ADC map, I, I can't really say, and received a follow-up study two months later. And we see that there's a complete regression of the abnormalities, but there was also a lot of time for them to disappear. And in some cases, you can see um, damage occurring, especially in patients who had severe prolonged seizures or a severe status epilepticus. This is a patient who eventually died. Look at the thick skull. This is a patient with chronic epilepsy uh, who had taken anti-epileptic drugs for most of her life. It's a 41-year-old female patient, and that can cause skull thickening, as you know or not know. And we see that there is a holohemispheric cortical edema also involving the basal ganglia in this patient. The entire right cerebral hemisphere is involved. We interpreted this as 
uh, seizure related because we couldn't find another explanation, not to us as radiologists and our uh, neurology uh, and intensive care unit colleagues couldn't either. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And it's a bit strange that the basal ganglia are involved. Uh, I've read about it in the medical literature, but I haven't seen many cases uh, that to me were due to seizures in which the basal ganglia were involved. But in this case, we assumed it to be the case. And we see on T1-weighted images that there is clear cortical laminar necrosis. So basically permanent chronic damage of the cortex due to the seizure, which is a not that frequent finding, especially not if it were short first time seizures and not a status epilepticus. Uh, this is another example, a follow-up study and a patient who had a right temporal seizure related edema also involving the hippocampus, but also right temporal neocortex on day one. Uh, there was a lot of edema on day five. It had already diminished greatly, but hadn't disappeared completely yet. And on day 60, it was completely gone. But what do we see? The right hippocampus looks smaller compared to the other side. The signal is a bit increased. This is a hippocampal sclerosis. And hippocampal sclerosis is also described in the literature and has been observed by me as um, a secondary finding following uh, a post-ictal hippocampal or a seizure-related hippocampal edema. Of course, if you don't have previous examinations, so examinations of the patient before the patient had the seizure, it's hard to say if this was a pre-existing hippocampal sclerosis or not. In this case, I didn't have previous MRI examinations, so it's hard for me to be 100% sure is this now, well, it's impossible to be sure if this is a consequence of having suffered a status epilepticus or if this was the cause of the status epilepticus. And that's often a problem when it comes to hippocampal sclerosis, but that's another story. So let's summarize. In the majority of cases, both if patients suffered a single short seizure or if they had status epilepticus or prolonged seizures, there will be complete regression of the signal abnormalities. Um, secondary changes are mainly seen in patients with prolonged seizures and following status epilepticus and include hippocampal sclerosis, cortical laminar necrosis, and cortical atrophy. And the majority of cases, however, seizure-induced MRI abnormalities will disappear completely. And it's difficult to say uh, what the exact timing is because it's difficult to find studies who prospectively evaluated them uh, and most studies are done retrospectively and there's a wide variability at the timing of follow-up studies. So it's hard to say how long these uh, abnormalities can or should be present. In my experience, once the patient stops seizing, they disappear quite rapidly. In the medical literature, I have found that they should be gone in about three months, which is a pretty long time if you ask me. But if you still see them after three months, well, then I think you should suspect something else. Then let's talk a bit about differential diagnosis. We have a lot of entities that can present with seizures or with status epilepticus and in whom the MRI abnormalities can look very similar to what we observe in seizure-induced MRI abnormalities. And a classical example are toxic metabolic diseases with cortical diffusion restriction, like a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, a hypoglycemic encephalopathy, or a hepatic encephalopathy. And I'm not going to go into detail on how to differentiate this different and these different entities. That's not uh, this presentation's topic, uh, but what they have in common and what is less seen in seizure-induced abnormalities, that is that these are often bilateral symmetrical uh, abnormalities. And very often there's also a suggestive clinical context. For instance, a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is something that you will see in a patient who has suffered a severe cardiac arrest and who had to be reanimated for a long period of time. And a hepatic encephalopathy is typically seen in patients with chronic liver disease, just to give you an example. So clinical, uh, clinical context and the fact that these abnormalities are bilateral and very symmetrical uh, is basically a clue to the fact that these probably are not just seizure-induced, but are caused by some kind of toxic metabolic disorder. Another entity would be Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. In this patient, we see some increased signal of the cortex on the flare studies, but there's no real swelling of the cortex, we must say, associated with an increased signal on the fusion-weighted images and a low signal on the ADC map, as you can see. But 
Uh, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease is often symmetrical but can be asymmetrical, like in this patient. But in Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, the pericentral region is often spared, which can be a clue to the diagnosis, and it's also the case here. Uh, there can be basal ganglia and or thalamic involvement, doesn't necessarily have to be, but uh, can be present. And the clinical context will also be different because these patients will often have rapidly progressive dementia. Uh, uh, and that is not present in the majority of patients who have suffered a seizure. So, but it's also, it also belongs to the differential diagnosis of cortical diffusion restriction. This is a patient with cortical edema. Uh, we see cortical edema in the left occipital lobe. It, is a high sig it has a high signal on the diffusion weighted images, but on the ADC map, well, okay, it's a bit dark, but looks mainly dark in the subcortical white matter cortex, maybe a little, but it's not really, well, it's a bit in between. Um, this is a typical location for let's call it a stroke-like abnormality in MILAS. And what's MILAS? It's mitochondrial encephalomyelitis with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes, quite a mouthful. It's basically a disorder belonging to the group of the inborn errors of metabolism. It's a mitochondrial disorder. And these patients often present with stroke-like episodes in which you will see cortical swelling on flare with or without diffusion restriction, mostly without actually in a non-vascular distribution and with a predilection for the parietal uh, occipital region. Uh, what is also typical for patients with MILAS as they often have calcifications in the basal ganglia and the globus pallidus, which can be seen on CT or on T2 star or susceptibility weighted images. And they also often have what is called a shifting spread pattern. And what does it mean? Well, literally what it says on the on the one study, they will have abnormalities in, let's say, the parietal occipital region. And on the next one, these abnormalities will have disappeared or diminished, but they will have abnormalities in another region. And let's give you an example. This is a patient with MILAS, has had several stroke-like episodes uh, involving mainly the parietal occipital region. This looks like old secondary damage and tissue loss with some dilatation of the posterior horn of the left uh, lateral ventricle. And we see that there is some cortical edema, cortical subcortical edema involving the right temporal occipital region. And this has disappeared on a follow-up study about a month later, but now we see new abnormalities and both frontal lobes. So this is a nice example of the shifting spread pattern you can see in MELAS. Um, now, when it comes to edema and the mesiotemporal region, there's definitely one thing you should always consider before calling something seizure-related, and that is herpes simplex encephalitis. I'm showing you two patients who both have edema of the right temporal lobe, involving the hippocampus and one of these has herpes simplex encephalitis can you tell which one uh, well maybe maybe some of you will say it's going to be patient number two and then you are correct because in patient number two if we magnify the right temporal lobe a bit we see these very small t2 hypo intense cortical lesions reflecting very small hemorrhages which is something you won't see in seizure induced abnormalities but can be seen in a herpes simplex encephalitis and you can also have some gyri form enhancement but technically speaking that can also be seen in seizure induced abnormalities I don't have examples to show you because in most patients we didn't administer gadolinium. So I simply don't have examples, but theoretically it's possible due to the disruption of the blood brain barrier. So, anyways, this patient had a herpes simplex encephalitis, and the second patient, was there a way to be sure that wasn't herpes? Well, technically speaking, no, not on day one. On day one, if you see this, an edema involving the right temporal lobe, including the mesial temporal area, you would have to say this could be herpes simplex encephalitis. But on day five, it had diminished. On day 60, it was gone. And a herpes simplex encephalitis will get worse before it 
gets better and basically it doesn't get better because it rarely disappears without leaving a lot of or causing a lot of tissue damage. You will have cystic encephalomalacia uh, in the majority of patients and that's simply not present here. Here we only have some hypocampal sclerosis. I have already shown you this case. So this was seizure-related cortical edema, but the main message is Wow, you can't be sure. So if you see this, you still have to call possible herpes simplex encephalitis and your neurologist will have to rule it out because purely based on radiological characteristics, there is no way to be 100% sure that this is just seizure related and can't be due to a herpes simplex. I wish I could tell you otherwise, but it's just the way it is. And this is another patient who presented with the status epilepticus. And on these uh, imaging studies, maybe you see the abnormality, maybe you don't, but let, let's magnify a bit. On flare, we see some subtle flare signal increase involving the uncus and the right hippocampus. We also see it on T2-weighted images. On diffusion-weighted images, there's also some signal increase, and it's black, especially in the region of the amygdala and the uncus on the ADC map. Now, the patient is in status epilepticus, so it's tempting to call this maybe seizure-induced MRI abnormality. It's also very, very subtle, uh, but this is the follow-up study performed four days later. Okay, I don't think anyone is having any doubts about what's going on here. This was basically an early stage herpes simplex encephalitis. So this case illustrates that if you are dealing with mesiotemporal abnormalities, mesiotemporal edema, uh, you definitely have to rule out herpes simplex encephalitis because it has a very bad prognosis, even when treated. And the only thing you can do to improve that prognosis a little bit is start early and viral treatment. In the end, it's a diagnosis based on lumbar puncture, but nevertheless, as radiologists, we also have a role to play. If you see this, alert your physician could be herpes simplex encephalitis. You don't want to be caught with your uh, pants down in this case, or you don't want to be confronted with a clear herpes simplex encephalitis four days after you call this a possible seizure-induced hippocampal edema. And are there ways to distinguish an early herpes simplex virus encephalitis from post-ictal changes? This is based on my experience, but I find this useful. An early herpes simplex virus encephalitis, diffusion restriction will be patchy and involve uh, well, most of the hippocampus and the amygdala. There is no specific pattern here. While in post-ictal changes, and I've already told you that, the dentate gyrus will typically be spared, so the central part of the hippocampus on axial images, and uh, diffusion restriction will mostly be seen in the lateral part of the hippocampus, the so-called summer CA1 sector. Nevertheless, even then, I would be very prudent before calling it purely seizure-related. Another differential diagnosis that, uh, according to me, is not that difficult, but these patients often present with epilepsy or with status epilepticus as a so-called PRESS or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. It's a syndrome that is often uh, seen in patients with malignant hypertension, acute kidney failure, or who are being treated with uh, immunosuppressants or chemotherapy, and they typically present with headaches, visual disturbances, and or seizures. And they have uh, typically mainly subcortical white matter edema, can also be some cortical edema, and the watershed regions with the predilections with the predilection for the posterior watershed regions, namely the parieto occipital region on both sides. So press in my opinion is not a very difficult differential diagnosis, uh, but you should just know it exists and what it looks like, and generally but not always, there is no diffusion restriction. And this is just something funny I stumbled upon. So for preparing this presentation, I looked up a lot of literature, and this is a very nice article I found in Neurology published in 1995, in which the authors described reversible MRI abnormalities following seizures in a total of eight patients. And the authors said, well, we, we observed reversible abnormalities, mainly on T2 and flare images and patients following seizures. And we believe these are uh, 
caused by the seizures or the result of the seizures. And when you look at the images, the, Im the, uh, and the authors all also describe it, the abnormalities are mainly located in the posterior regions. Here, parietooccipitally, but here there's also some involvement of the cortex and the anterior watershed region. And most of these patients were oncological patients treated with uh, immunos or um, transplant patients treated with uh, immunosuppressants and or chemotherapy. And I looked at the images in this publication and those were all examples of press and the clinical findings or the clinical context was also very suggestive of press. So these authors, press was first described in 1995 or 1996. These authors were actually earlier to describe press, but they just didn't realize it. They didn't realize they were dealing with a new entity and that these abnormalities were not uh, seizure induced, but these were the cause of the seizure. And it's also a nice example of be very careful. This is historical. We now know that PRES exists. It's a separate neuroclinical syndrome. Um, but maybe in situations, I'm going to talk more about that later, where we're dealing with so called seizure induced abnormalities, we're maybe dealing with entities we don't know yet as was the case in 1995 when authors attributed seizures as the cause of what was basically a press. Um, let's summarize our differential diagnosis now. So what is the main differential diagnosis for seizure-induced imaging abnormalities? Well, if it's mainly cortical edema with diffusion restriction, toxic metabolic disorders, which are bilateral and uh, symmetrical, and Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, in which there is often perirolandic sparing, and in which patients present generally with rapidly progressive dementia. Uh, then we have cortical edema with or without diffusion restriction, mainly involving the parieto-occipital region, which is typically seen in the mitochondrial, uh, mitochondrial disease MELAS. And another clue would be the shifting spread pattern on follow-up studies. Then we have herpes simplex encephalitis when you're dealing with Udema involving the hippocampus and especially if it also involves the temporal neocortex. Uh, it can be a difficult differential, especially in early, uh, uh, early herpes simplex encephalitis. So always consider it. You don't want to miss it. And other differential diagnostic uh, considerations I didn't illustrate would be autoimmune encephalitis or a classical hippocampal infarction. I've talked more about those in my presentation on hippocampal pathology, which is also available on this channel. And lastly, when you see mainly parieto-occipital cortical edema, but especially subcortical white matter edema uh, involving the watershed areas and patients with hypertension, kidney failure, chemotherapy, taking immunosuppressants, think press before you say it's seizure induced. Now, do seizure-induced uh, MRI abnormalities exist? That's a strange question to ask, but I've actually read editorials and uh, commentaries uh, disputing the fact that these exist. And I can understand why, because it's basically diagnosis of exclusion. And who's to say it's not something else that we just don't know yet, like in 1995 when... Uh, the first cases of press were interpreted as seizure induced. On the other hand, if you see something like this, this is a patient with a brain tumor, suffered a seizure, this is the brain tumor on T1 with gadolinium, which was the cause of the seizure. This patient also had ipsilateral hippocampal edema, which resolved on follow up studies. How? This, so it disappeared. This, these are the diffusion weighted images, clear diffusion restriction. If this is not seizure induced, how else would you explain it? So we're, we're once again confronted with, well, we have no other explanation, but I don't think that in these situations we'll ever find another explanation. To me, this can only be seizure induced. And we have a pathophysiological mechanism that can kind of explain how this occurs. This is an example of a patient with uh, parieto-occipital cortical edema on the left side, as we see here. A uh, patient had recurring seizures, and we also see the cause of the seizures. This was an intraventricular cavernoma. The cavernoma was removed, and these abnormalities disappeared on follow-up studies, and the patient became seizure-free, uh, also with the aid of anti-epileptic treatment. And this is also something uh, important to keep in mind. 
and patients with seizure-induced abnormalities on MRI, and about a third, you will also observe a structural lesion that can be the possible cause of the seizure. And we have now uh, seen a patient with a cavernoma. The previous patient had a brain tumor that was a metastasis from a lung carcinoma, to be more specific. Um, so also look for possible structural lesions and these patients that can be possible epileptogenic lesions. Now, this is a syndrome I want you to know as well. This is a 37-year-old female patient who suffered, uh, who was brought to our hospital in States Epilepticus, started following a short febrile illness and had no medical history. So no history of seizures, had never suffered a seizure before. And then immediately status epilepticus, what's going on there? On these T2-weighted images, we see that there is clear edema involving the hippocampus on both sides. We can also see that on the flare images over here. And we see on these two weighted images that there's also a subtle signal increase and in the caudate nucleus and the putamen on both sides. It's very subtle, but it's there. Can also be seen on the diffusion weighted images, very subtle, and clear diffusion restriction and the hippocampal head on both sides. And with once again the edema on the two weighted images involving both hippocampuses. The patient was transferred to our hospital from another hospital. And in that other hot hospital, the patient had received an MRI. 10 days earlier. And then the, on those studies, what do we see? Once again, very subtle signal increase in the basal ganglia, but this time also involving this structure over here. And this is the clostrum. The clostrum is a gray matter structure, the function of which is unknown. It is rarely uh, abnormal. There are uh, very little diseases that basically involve the claustrum or in which the claustrum has an abnormal signal. Uh, and the claustrum sign, so bilateral increased signal and the claustrum has been described as a recurring phenomenon on imaging studies in patients with a so-called NORS or fires. And what are those entities? And on diffusion weighted images, we see some increase but also in the hippocampus. This is the hippocampal tail over here on both sides. Well, basically, NORS and fires, they're basically just descriptive terms. NORS means new onset refractory status epilepticus, and fires is, um, well, basically, NORS preceded by a febrile illness. It's febrile illness. Oh, I can't remember what the rest stands for. But it's basically the same as NORS. So it's basically a refractory status epilepticus preceded by a febrile illness. So this is not a diagnosis. This is basically just the condition. That's what the patient has. The patient has a status epilepticus. These were generally, well, these are always previously healthy patients, meaning they are not patients who had an epileptic syndrome never have suffered a seizure before. And for the most part, they are pretty young, school age children and young adults, especially in the case of fires. And why is that? Because we have more febrile illnesses in school age children. They get uh, colds at school, so they are more vulnerable. And um, in the acute setting, there cannot be found a structural or metabolic cause. So we won't find metabolic derangements when we examine the blood of these patients. And on MRIs of the brain, we won't find a brain tumor or a signs uh, or other abnormalities structural that can induce the status. So the real question is, what is causing it? And it's still unclear. In about half of patients, no explanation is found ever. So those are cryptogenic. And about 40%, after a lot of uh, testing, eventually um, an autoimmune abnormality is found. And the final diagnosis is it's caused or it's a sign of an autoimmune encephalitis. And other causes are found in about 10%. On imaging, these patients can have bilateral mesotemporal abnormalities, as we have seen in our patient. And they can also have the claustrum sign. And the claustrum sign is probably seen earlier in the disease course. The question is, what are those? Are these seizure-related abnormalities? Or do these abnormalities re reflect the actual disease process of which we are still unsure what it is exactly? It's an open question. I don't know. And at the moment, I don't think anyone knows. But it also makes you wonder, 
And a lot of patients with status epilepticus, especially if they develop a status and have never suffered a seizure before, like, um, well, not this patient, this patient had chronic epilepsy uh, with a very severe cortical edema, in this case also involving the contralateral cerebellar hemisphere, you can wonder and ask yourself the question, um, could it be that these are not just mere seizure-induced abnormalities, but can be the reflection of an as yet unknown disease process, like some unknown, very rare mitochondrial disease or some still unknown seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. It's just speculation, but I think that in a subset of these patients, especially in patients with status epilepticus, who have no previous history and whom the status is very severe, well, that must be the case. Uh, but yeah, we'll have to wait until someone discovers it. Um, now, let's conclude my message. Uh, let's conclude this presentation. It was a pretty long presentation. What do I want you to remember? I've already summarized the most important things in each subtopic. So for me, keep in mind that seizure-induced MRI abnormalities or or should be a diagnosis of exclusion only call them as a radiologist when you have no alternative radiological explanation and prefer preferentially after you had some feedback from your neurologist about the clinical context and we like to see them disappear on follow-up imaging uh, once the status has resolved or if the patient is no longer or when the patient is no longer seizing i have showed you the very characteristic imaging patterns we can uh, see uh, involving edema of the cortex hippocampus and or the thalamus especially the pulvinar keep in mind that these abnormalities are basically not that frequent and are seen in less than 10 percent of patients following a seizure and they are mainly seen in patients who have suffered prolonged seizures or a status epilepticus and the differential diagnosis is quite broad so and you have to consider each and every option because once again it's a diagnosis of exclusion and you definitely don't want to miss a herpes simplex encephalitis. So that concludes my presentation. Many thanks to these people who, in the course of years, have helped me uh, gathering cases. Uh, Dr. Kerry Didier, Dr. Jesper Dirks, Dr. Kathleen Pannekoek, and uh, Dr. Stephanie van den Bosse, also called Robin. And this is my email address. If uh, you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can leave a comment and the comments section on the YouTube channel, or you can email me directly at neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. And thank you very much for watching.